little change of plans, Clayton. We're going to actually we're gonna have Matt go at the end here, but we're going to go ahead and get right into the message. I felt like such a good spirit right now, man. Just hearing you guys sing praises to our God is uh, just a great lead into this message. So go to Genesis 29, the first book of the Bible. And if you've got your phone, maybe your Bible's on your phone, that's great. Bring up Genesis 29. If you've got a physical Bible, that's easy to find. It's the first book of your, of your Bible, Genesis chapter number 29. And uh, man, it is so good to see everybody this morning. Um, I, uh, I want to continue our series on, on you know, the family, marriage, just all these different elements that go with being part of a family. And how many of you ever get frustrated with family? Raise your hand. Come on, how many of you ever get frustrated with family members? All right. And, and here's the deal. You get frustrated with family, but the series is called Nothing Beats a Family. And that's because it's so true. You know, nothing beats a family. Imagine if you had no family at all, you know. And, it, and it, you know, today I want to kind of focus in on marriage and it's, it's going to apply, though, to everyone. If you're single, please pay attention. You need what I'm going to give you this morning. Uh, desperately, you need this, okay? Because this is going to apply to everyone here. It's one of those marriage sermons that's going to be about all of us, okay? So please don't think, I'm not married, I'm never getting married, and I'm going to tune him out, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, watch the pregame on the football games while he's preaching, okay? No, listen, because you desperately are going to need what we're going to see and talk about from God's Word today. And, you know, as we think about marriage, um, it's funny the things that, that you think in your mind, it's funny the things that you think in your mind about marriage before you're married. Would you all agree that what you think about marriage isn't always what you experience when you're married? All right. So, you know, maybe, ladies, you dreamed about a Prince Charming that's coming and sweeping you off your feet, you know, and, uh, and, and you got all these grandiose ideas. Guys, when you thought about marriage, maybe before you were married, you probably dreamed about the fact that once you are married, you're just going to lay around all day embracing your wife in marital intimacy. It's just going to be hugging and kissing all day long. I mean, it's just going to be all day, every day. And, you know, a lot of the things that we dreamed about with marriage and thought about, they were myths. You know, they're fairy tales. And there's a lot of marriage myths that people still think. Um, one of those marriage myths, i put a few of them up on the screen here. If I marry the right one, marriage will be easy. That's a myth. That's a myth, okay? Um, here's another one. My spouse should complete me. That's, that's another myth. My, my spouse should complete me. We're going to talk about that a lot this morning, so I won't elaborate right now, okay? Another myth is good couples never have major problems. And that's just simply not true. Can I get an amen, huh? I mean... Good, godly, Christ-loving people have marriage problems. Marriage is not always easy, period. I mean, you know, it's, it's just not. And, and uh, you know, uh, another myth is, and this goes along with what I just said about having problems. Here's a myth. It would be better if I was married to somebody else. Maybe. Probably not. Okay, probably not. Um, let, let me just share this with you. The, the stats don't support that line of thinking. Okay, so I just want you to know that, that, that that's a long shot idea. Okay, because the statistics show that things don't get better on your second and third and fourth marriage. Now, if Christ gets involved, then of course Christ can do all things. Amen. Some of you weren't saved, you've got a divorce in your past, but you did things right the second time. Christ is the center now, and it is great. And that can definitely happen when Christ is involved. All I'm simply saying is, if you just want out of your marriage because you think another one's going to be better, statistics don't support that. The idea that you're going to get rid of the current spouse, get you a new one, and live happily ever after, statistics don't show that that works very often. Okay. 
So these are myths. So what's the best marriage in the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? What's the best marriage in the Bible? And if you study out marriages in the Bible, do you know what you find? There are no perfect marriages in the Bible. You won't find one. Um, God does allow us to catch a brief glimpse in Genesis 2, before sin enters the picture, of Adam and Eve, and they're living in a perfect relationship with God, therefore, with each other. And there's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no tension, there's no strife. They're living in a perfect relationship with their Creator, and therefore, they're living in full enjoyment of each other's fellowship. I mean, you think about the garden there, and before sin entered, there's no need for money, no in-laws, <laughs> right? God created them. They had no mom and dad, so there's no in-laws in the picture. I mean, you think about in the garden, and, and you think about how perfect everything is. I mean, no need for money, in-laws, or clothes. <laughs> Woo! Does it get any better than that? No need for money, in-laws, or clothes. Y'all can quote that tomorrow, all right. <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't get any better, right? So our, our text, Genesis 29, is about anything <laughs> but the perfect marriage. It's the story of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. A Abraham would have been his grandpa. Abraham and Sarah was his grandma and grandpa. So he comes from quite a line. Um, Jacob was a twin. Esau was his brother, and he, Jacob was a, a deceiver. He was a con man. He, he liked to con people and deceive people and trick people. In fact, he tricked his brother out of his inheritance, and, and Esau got so hopping mad that he went to kill his brother, Jacob, and Jacob had to get out of Dodge, man. I mean, he had to get out of town. He fled for his life. He ends up in a faraway country, and he ends up meeting a girl, and her name was Rachel. And, and he ends up at this well, you know, and Rachel comes up with this flock of sheep, and they meet, and he is immediately smitten. I mean, he is obsessed with her. And, and it seems as if Jacob knew there was something missing in himself, and so he thought in his mind, she's going to fix it. I mean, here's a guy that never had his father's love. If you remember, there was complete dysfunction in the family. Um, you remember that Isaac favored Esau and hung out with him outside, while Jacob had a kind of a doting mother, you know, Rebecca, that doted on him, and, and, and he was a, a, a mama's boy from the word go. And so... He never had his father's love, never really experienced that. He's now had to flee, so no longer is mama there. His twin brother wants to kill him. You talk about problems. At this point, he didn't know the love of God either. He was a deceiver, a liar, manipulating his way through life. But the Bible says in, in, there in Genesis 29, in verse number 18, it says, Jacob loved God. Rachel. He falls madly in love with this girl. And, and what's it based on? What's this based on? This, this, this boom. You know. Well, look at verse 16. It says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were tender, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Um, it when it talks about Leah being tender-eyed, that, that was a way back then of saying that she was just a very simple, plain-looking girl. She was just an average-looking girl. You know, she's not going to win any beauty contest. Leah was just your average girl. Rachel, on the other hand, the Bible says was beautiful. It means lovely in form. In fact, it says there she's beautiful in form and appearance. Teenagers today would say she was hot. Okay? When I was growing up, she would have been cool. But now that we've changed, it's, it's, 
the temperature things changed. <laughs> it's funny how things change, right? She's not cool. She's hot now. All right. So she's hot. Jacob, man, we know what, what grabbed this guy's attention. All right. So no evidence of prayer here, by the way. No evidence of seeking after God. He was just like, wow. That's the girl for me. What was his motive? Well, it was sight-oriented. Which, by the way, nothing wrong with that. I think there needs to be that physical attraction as long as there's something of substance to go along with it. So he's thinking, this is the one, man. She is it. She's going to fill that empty place in me. She's going to complete me. And, and most people in her marriage with expectations about our spouse that no human being was ever designed to live up to. The reality is this. The Bible says in marriage, two shall become what? One. But you got to have two first. You got to have two complete whole people, not a half a person. So if you enter marriage with the idea, well, this is going to fix me. If you enter into marriage really not whole as a person, there's going to be problems. Now, I'm not saying the marriage won't make it and won't survive. I'm just saying there's going to be serious issues. If you're thinking this person is going to make me finally happy, they're going to finally bring happiness to my life, they are going to be the source of my joy, they are going to make me feel whole. If you enter marriage with that idea, it's kind of like a tick on a dog relationship. It's like a tick on a dog, man, just sucking the life out of that other person, expecting them to impart life and wholeness to you. It's like a tick on a dog, man. You just suck the life out of that other person, wanting them to make you feel whole and feel complete and feel like somebody. You know, or worst case, it's tick on tick. It's husband and wife both trying to, trying to get out of that other person what they need and, 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 and just sucking the life out of each other. And so many times this happens, um, more often than not, more often than not. Now, hopefully we grow in Christ and we, come out and we realize how foolish that is, but this happens a lot. And so many times, you know, I get tickled because I've done a lot of weddings through the years, and and. The husband says something like, I'm going to love you as Christ loved the church. I am going to love you and cherish you and nourish you from this day forward forever. And in his mind, though, many times he's thinking, I need you to make me feel important. And the girl says, I'm going to love you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health cleave to you as long as we live. What she really means is, you are my Prince Charming, and you are going to finally make me feel loved and make up for what I didn't get from mom or didn't get from dad, what's missing in my life. You're going to make up for that, and you're going to complete me. Well, that brings me to a statement in your handout that you really need to get, and that is this. In marriage, we are not made to complete each other, but complement one another. All right, listen, you do not make the other person whole. You can't, all right? In fact, um, I've got something here I was going to use as an illustration. This is some, these are some things, um, candles, that are hanging over in one of the rooms in our office building, and it's a, it's a set. It's a pair. And so they hang on the wall, and there's like a picture in between them, and you got one here and one here. And, and you look at those candles, and it's like they complement each other. They look better together, but they don't complete each other. They complement each other, but they don't complete each other. Each candle can fulfill its own purpose on its own. They each have a wick. They each have wax. And I think sometimes we view marriage as the husband is the wick 
and she's the wax, and without the other person, you're broken, you're not complete, and you hear that often, that thought in songs, especially country songs, right? I am nothing without you, right? Really, so you're nothing, right? Nothing. Well, that means you're looking for that other person for completeness and wholeness, if you really believe that you're nothing without the other person. You, you, you're, you, 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 the idea you hear in songs is the idea of, you know, I'm not a real person without you. You know, you complete me. You make me feel whole. You're made to complement, not complete each other. And, and it says in your handout there, God did not design marriage to fix something that was broken in the other person. Okay? We don't get fixed by our spouse. We can only find that in Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can fix what's broken in us. And we all do have broken stuff. Listen, every one of us in here are sinners. We all have baggage. We all have insecurities. We all have a past. We've all got issues. And, and, and to a certain extent, understanding what I mean, we, we're all broken. We're all sinners. There are no perfect marriage partners. There just aren't. And only Jesus can fix what's broken in us. And for me to expect Denise to fix what's broken in me and make me feel whole and complete and bring joy to my life, that's putting something on her that God never intended for me to put on her. God brought the woman to the man and the Bible says she was fitting for him. In other words, she would compliment him. But it wasn't that Adam was broken and couldn't function. Adam wasn't broken. It wasn't that he couldn't function. The idea of Scripture is he just he didn't have anybody to share life with. But when we go into marriage looking to be made whole and looking to that other person to fix us, we put a God-sized responsibility on that other person, and God never intended for them to carry that kind of a load. And so... I want to talk about that from our text this morning. What happens when we go into marriage? And that's why I say you know, this is very applicable to singles because this is preventive maintenance for singles. Okay? It may, it, 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 you know, may be something that def- definitely needs to be repaired in existing marriages because some of you, to be honest, some of you right now, you're, you, you tend to suck the life out of the other person because you, you're looking for them to make you feel a certain way, or feel important, or feel complete, or feel whole. And then some of you are single, and one day you might get married. I thought I might get some amens right there, but I didn't get any amens. (laughs) You might get married, so you really need what I'm going to share with you. When you go into marriage looking to be completed, looking to be made whole by your spouse, looking to them to create joy in your life, Here's what ends up happening. Number one, in your handout, number one is that you will compromise more than you should in order to get there. Um, if, If you're convinced that this person you're marrying is the answer, they're the answer for my life. They are gonna make me happy finally, they are gonna make me feel secure, they are gonna make me complete and whole. And feel like I got purpose. If you're looking to them for all of that, then you're going to end up compromising more than you should in order to get where you think you ought to be married to them. Um, In this text, Jacob served seven years in order to get Rachel. And I know that seems strange to us that in verse 18 he says... uh, He told her dad, I'll serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And I know that seems kind of weird. He's going to serve her dad seven years in order for the privilege of marrying her. I know that seems odd to us, but that was their culture. Those who have studied that culture tell us that what would have been ordinary for that time, Jacob offered him four times more than what would have been common in that time period. There is no prayer, there's no wisdom sought, no counsel from his parents. He just goes into this thing like gangbusters for a girl that he's only known a month. And he is infatuated. And he offers four times more than what was appropriate. 
And his attitude, you can just tell, is that I will do anything in order to get this girl. And that's what happens when you enter into a relationship looking for that, uh, convinced that other person is going to be the answer for your life. That they are going to make you feel whole and complete. This is exactly what happens. You compromise more than you should in order to get there. For example, you take a girl. And this girl is a godly girl. And she wants to save her body for marriage. She wants to go down to the marriage altar pure. But the guy she's dating is pressuring her to have sex. And so, you know, she's thinking, well, he's the answer. He makes me feel important and complete, and he makes me feel whole. And if I give my body to him, maybe he'll give me his heart. And if you feel like that you're not complete in yourself, you feel like, and you feel desperate, and you feel like you're not whole in Christ, then you're looking for that other person to complete you or fix you or make you feel important or wanted, then all of a sudden you're willing to pay any cost to get there. You're willing to pay any cost to get what you think you need out of that relationship, and that's a dangerous place to be. Dangerous place to be. Say you got a guy. I don't want to just pick on guys here. I'll just pick on the girls a little bit, all right? So you got this guy. He's a good guy, godly guy. He's dating this girl. And you know what? She really doesn't treat him very good. You know, she's harsh. She's unkind. She's just demanding. She's spoiled rotten. She just wants him to, you know, continue to support her in the lifestyle in which she has become accustomed in other words, she's spoiled. She's a spoiled brat, used to having whatever she wants and getting her way. And so she doesn't treat him very good at all. But his attitude is, well, I know she's really not that great, but I can change her after we get married. <laughs> that always works out great, doesn't it? That always works out really great. It's, let me just say this to you. It is not your job to change her. That's Jesus' job. Okay? You can't change her. You can't change him. So if your idea is, I know this person isn't what really what they, you know, I, I know this person is sucking the life out of me. I know they're, they're, not, they're not all they should be, but I'll change them after we get married. You just forget that thought. <laughs> all right? By the way, when you're dating somebody, that's prob you're seeing the best that you're ever going to see, probably. <laughs> unless, unless Christ gets involved and changes that person, you're seeing them at their best right now when you're dating, okay? It don't go anywhere but down. I don't mean to be negative, but <laughs> somebody's got to tell these young people the truth, amen? Somebody's got to tell them the way it is. You're seeing them at their best, man, all cleaned up and all behaved, because they're wanting to snag you, all right? <laughs> so you're seeing them at their best. Now, again, Christ can get involved and change us, amen? So many of you are better than you were when you got married because Christ got involved. But I'm just saying you can't bank on that, that you're going to change them. By the way, you know what your job is? Your job is to change yourself. You, you can't change them. If we enter marriage with these kind of expectations of being made whole, them completing me, or I'm going to change them, you know, this is finally going to make me happy in my life, this is finally going to make me joyful, then you will always compromise more than you should to get there. And that's, that's not a good way to start a marriage. Not a good way to start a marriage. Second thing is this. Number two, when you go into marriage looking to be completed or made whole by your spouse, number two, you'll view marriage as a contract instead of a covenant from God. You know, you look at verse 21, okay? He serves for seven years. And then Jacob, look at verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled so that I may have relations with her. Man, how rude. He's talking to her dad. He's talking to the girl's father. You know? And it's like, I kept my part of the deal. Now you guys need to keep your part. 
She's going to fix what's wrong. This is my contractual relationship with her. And this is what happens. Instead of a covenant where we lay down our lives for each other, it's like a contract. I delivered this for you, so you're going to do this for me. And it becomes more of what's due to us. It becomes more of what is due rather than you being together in a covenant relationship with Christ. I'm putting up my end in this thing, so you better put up yours. And when we view marriage as a contract, one of the things that happens is sex becomes a, a, a payback and a tool, right? You do this for me, I'll do this for you. And, and believe me, that happens all the time. I'll get what I want out of my husband. I got the cards. <laughs> and they do, amen? Amen. Or cooperation becomes something you barter. Yeah, I'll agree to move, she thinks, if you build me my dream home. I've always wondered when we get there. So you barter. Well, if I give my wife the new car she wants, she won't mind if I work late every night. It becomes this bartering thing. And then dissatisfaction comes. Why? Because we're living exactly the opposite of Philippians 2.4. Look at the verse on the screen up here. It says, let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of what? Others. It's not all about you. And what happens is in marriage, many times, God wants us to be soulmates, but instead of soulmates, you become roommates. You know what roommates are, right? I had, when my first semester of college, I... I I was in a dorm, and in my, we had a big room, but in this room were like eight guys in one room. Let me tell you, you could film a Lysol commercial in there. <laughs> and let me tell you something, we tolerated each other. That's what roommates do. They tolerate each other. And instead of soulmates, you become roommates. Even worse than that, you become cellmates. And marriage becomes a prison that you're trapped in by this contract you signed. But that is not God's plan. God's intention is that two shall become one. Genesis 2 says, leave, cleave, become one flesh. Not roommates who barter. Not where it's a contract. No, you are living in a covenant relationship because you're one flesh in Christ. Number three, last thing is this. When you are looking to be made whole and complete by that other person, you will end up dissatisfied and disappointed. That's number three. Why? Because you aren't living in an abiding relationship with Christ, you end up disappointed. And you set your spouse up for failure. They can't achieve that. It's like Jacob had to marry her. She was beautiful, beautiful, and he had to marry her. Wedding day comes. The deceiver gets deceived. Mm. Hmm. Look at verse 22. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and prepared a feast. But in the evening he took Leah, his daughter. Remember tender-eyed Leah? And he brought her to Jacob, and Jacob had relations with her. Laban gave Zilpah, his maid, to his daughter Leah for a maidservant. In the morning Jacob discovered that it was Leah... And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did not I serve you for Rachel? Why then have you tricked me? The deceiver got deceived. The manipulator got manipulated. The conniver got connived. I don't know if that's a word, but. Say, so how'd that happen? Well, they went to a marriage tent. Obviously, it was dark. Jacob was probably a bit inebriated. He wakes up the next morning, looks over, and it isn't beautiful, Rachel. It's tender-eyed Leah. And he says, you tricked me. He's like, that's my MO. I'm the one that tricks people. I don't get tricked. Well, you got tricked. And this is what happens whenever you think someone other than Christ is going to meet your need and the lack that you feel in your life. You think you're going to bed with Rachel and you end up with Leah every single time. <laughs> Figuratively speaking, okay? Make sure I explain that. 
I got to marry her. She's so beautiful. And you go to bed with beauty, and one morning you wake up and say, that ain't beauty. That's the beast over there. <laughs> Bisto Maristo, man. Not beauty. It's the beast. You go to bed with him on the honeymoon and say, I finally found my Prince Charming that's going to make me feel important. <laughs> He's going to bring joy to my life. He's going to complete me. Yeah, you go to bed with Prince Charming. One morning you wake up, you're like, that ain't Prince Charming. That's Frankenstein. <laughs> He's Frankenstein. It leads to dissatisfaction, disappointment. You think your spouse is going to meet your needs and fix your problems, and you end up disappointed. Leah, by the way, did the same thing. Leah was trying to find completion through Jacob. She lived in the shadow of her sister. Look at verse 31. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and gave birth to a son. She called his name Reuben, for she said, surely the Lord has looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and said, because the Lord's heard that I was unloved, he's therefore given me this son also. And then she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and gave birth to a son. Said, now this time my husband will be joined to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Hmm. Now I'll get what I need from him. Now he'll love me. She's trying to find completion through Jacob. She's trying to find meaning and purpose in her life through Jacob. How many couples have done this? If we just have a baby, it will fix our marriage. If I just make more money and give her what she wants, she'll love me. She'll really love me. If I just have that surgery, he'll love me. If. And you always end up dissatisfied. And in this story, there's no prayer, no seeking after God. They are searching for the one. But it was the wrong one they were looking for. And people in her marriage thinking, if I find the right one, if I find the right one, that right one, we are going to get married and live happily ever after with no problems. And they get married and they have all kinds of problems. And they don't understand why. Can I share with you why? It's because that spouse you married, they are not the one. He is the one. You're searching for the wrong one. You're thinking, i got to find Mr. Right and everything will be great. Jesus is your one. Your spouse is always your two. Je what did Jesus say? The first commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart. Second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is your one. You get married and you find out that your spouse has issues too. They have insecurities. They have needs. They have problems. They can't fix you. Because they got their own problems. And so then we say, well, they're not completing me. They, they must be the wrong person. You're right. They are the wrong person to make you whole. He is the right person to make you whole. You need to find the right one. And that's Jesus Christ. It's almost like Leah kind of got a glimpse of that and figured that out a little bit. Look at verse 35. It says, she conceived again and gave birth to a son. She said, now... I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Did you, do you know what line? Do you know who came from Judah, that boy that was born to her? Jesus Christ came from the line of Judah. Now I will praise the Lord. Now I'm going to find contentment in him, not in Jacob. And what started out so wrong ended up right. I will praise the Lord, she said. And even if your marriage started out wrong, it can be made right. Completion is found in Christ, not in your spouse. And you need to quit putting that God-sized responsibility and burden on them because it will frustrate them and disappoint you. They cannot, listen to me, your spouse cannot meet the deepest longings of your soul. Only Christ can do that. The Bible says this in Colossians 2.10. It says that we are complete in him. It's in Christ we find forgiveness. 
It's in Christ that we have adoption into his family. In Christ, we're accepted. In Christ, we find a new heart. In Christ, we can do all things. In Christ, we find his righteousness. In Christ, there's no condemnation. In Christ, I find wholeness, purpose, and meaning for my life. All that's found in Jesus, not in Denise. I love her. I'm so glad I can share my life with her. But if I'm looking for her for all those things, acceptance, wholeness, purpose, meaning, importance, I'm going to be disappointed. And if she looks to me for all those things, she's going to be disappointed. Are you in a marriage relationship where you're trying to get out of your spouse what you can only get through Christ? But you don't know my spouse. The reality is they may always be what they are right now. That's just reality. But completeness in you as a person, completeness in you as a whole person is not to be found in them. It's to be found in Jesus Christ. If you've trusted Christ, you're complete in Christ. You've got to work on your relationship with Christ. Let girls that are not married, guys who are not married, listen to me. You better be working on your relationship with Jesus Christ or you'll end up in a situation like this and you'll be very disappointed. Singles, listen to me. Single adults are are teenagers. Are you on the road to discover that person that's going to fix you, complete you, make you whole? That is a great pursuit. Let me point you in the right direction. It's Jesus Christ. And when two people come together that have found their completeness and their satisfaction in their relationship with Christ, they've got a basis to have a great marriage. Maybe you're in a marriage that's coming apart at the seams. It's not too late. Even something that's horrible can be made right in Christ. And it begins with both of you realizing that your wholeness as a person can only be found in Christ. Jesus is the right one. We want you to find that right one. The the name of the message is finding the right one in marriage. Who's the right one? It's Jesus. He's the right one. And if both of you are finding the right one in marriage, you'll have a great relationship together. Let's pray together right now.